Hello and welcome to Africa Now, the podcast that takes a fresh look at events on the continent and at how Africa relates to the rest of the world. I'm Martine Dennis. Today, Liberians vote in the closest presidential runoff since the Civil War. We're going to be gauging the mood in Monrovia. We've got an exclusive briefing from prominent Nigerian politician turned academic, Kayuri Foyemi. He's calling for a Marshall Plan for the Sahel. And what's $34.8 billion between friends? We've been in the corridors of the Africa Investment Forum in Marrakesh. Find out who left Morocco happy. And discover how little I know about rugby. As Herbert Mensah tells me, the sport is more than just fun, it's big business too. With me is Patrick Smith, editor of Africa Confidential. Hi, Patrick, how are you? Hi, Martine. Um, I'm pretty knackered. I've just come off a long haul flight from Cape Town, stuffed in coach class right at the back of the uh, plane. If anyone thinks journalists are privileged <laughs> people, forget it. We're My heart bleeds, Patrick. Here. And uh, Donu Kogbra, the Abuja-based journalist and political commentator. Are you well, Donu? Well, you know, I'm permanently traumatised in today's Nigeria, so no, I'm not very well. <laughs> OK, um, perhaps we can pick up on that a bit later on, Donu. Patrick, let's hand over to you. Uh, without more ado, take us to Liberia. Right. Uh, this morning, uh, we're very privileged to have Rodney C.A., who is a pioneering journalist. He's the co-founder of Front Page Africa, um, which has uh, achieved plenty of scoops in its history. Um, today, Rodney is joining us on the line just as people are voting in Liberia's second round of presidential elections. Um, Rodney, thanks very much for coming on. Can you tell us what the, the mood is today and, and how the turnout is? Because that seems to be a critical factor in these elections. Yes, but um, usually uh, the second round usually is a low turnout, which is happening today. Um, there have been lots of uh, calmness so far, no issues of um, violence. Um, but the build up to this today was has been very, very chaotic. chaotic. There have been violent scenes in Nimba, not East Liberia. There have been similar situations in some places in Monrovia where people have been um, from both parties have been doing propaganda on social media, um, trying to, yes, in fact, yesterday there was an incident where uh, the opposition United Party claimed that they had, there was a helicopter of, of pre-marked ballot boxes on a, um, arrived in Lofa County, the stronghold of Vice President Joseph Borkai, the former Vice President who's running against George Ware. And that um, kind of caused some chaos, but it was proven that those uh, helicopters were not actually carrying ballot boxes, but rather training materials for the ruling CDC. The, the big question for me, Rodney, is uh, how far are, are the tensions that are, are manifesting themselves uh, during this campaign? How far are they uh, resonating throughout the country? Of course, because we're talking 20 years since the end of the last civil war with more than 250,000 people mm -hmm. dead. This is a post-conflict society. Right. In fact, the ECOWAS yesterday issued a statement condemning what happened in uh, Lofa County yesterday and incidents in Nimba County. The U.S. Embassy in Liberia has been calling for calm, for peace. All the international stakeholders have been very keen to make sure that these elections are free and fair, that there, are, there aren't any uh, disturbances. But usually when there's uh, violence in election situations, it happens uh, usually when the numbers have been tabulated and announced. That's when either side can complain that they've cheated, and that's when the trouble starts. So in the next 24 to 48 hours, when the numbers start coming back, that's when we're going to see the extent of these uh, elections, whether it's going to be actual free of violence or chaos or not. The, the U.S. Embassy in Monrovia, Rodney, has issued a warning to people who engage in electoral malpractices or violence you know, regarding visa restrictions. Uh, in your opinion or experience, will that warning be effective? Well, as you know, most of 
uh, most people in Africa and West Africa particularly love to go to America. And I think the embassy realized that uh, placing a ban on, issue a threat of ban on people who cause problems in these elections is a way of maybe helping the country uh, move past the civil war because some of these incidents can lead to trouble. And there have been cases, on, especially on social media, there have been lots of hatred, animosity, exchange of hate messages and stuff that's been very, very intriguing and making this election like almost bloody without, you know. But there have been a lot of times where people have been complaining that there's just too much hatred going on. I think the visa restriction is a way of toning down those rhetorics. Um, whether they succeed in doing it, it remains to be seen. But the real impact will be known in the next few days when the results are being announced. That was Rodney Sia, editor and co-founder of Liberia's largest independent daily, Front Page Africa, and he was joining us from Monrovia. Now, we were also lucky enough to have some time with the prominent Nigerian politician turned academic, Kayodi Fayemi. Just after his lecture at King's College here in London, it was called Shifts in Global Power Relations and Implications for Africa. Donu, you know Coyote quite well, don't you? Tell us a little bit about him. Well, I'm heavily biased because both Coyote and his wife have been my friends since we were all students, uh, youngsters, gadding about in London. And, you know, in the case of Coyote and his wife, less of the gadding and more of the sort of socially responsible activities. They were not as frivolous as some of us when we were younger. <laughs> and then he went on to become a respected activist, uh, two-time governor, who, who became quite famous for refusing to inflame tensions when he lost an election. Um, which is not normal for Nigerian politicians. They don't normally say, you know, well, I don't want anybody to die. I don't want any unpleasantness. I'm going to step back and accept the result. Um, but Kayode did that, for which many people will always hold him in high esteem. He then became Minister of Solid Minerals and went back to being governor again. And in Nigeria, you can only have two terms. So his second term ended recently. And while during his second term, he was also chairman of the Governors Forum, which is a very influential body for the subnational governments, of which there are 36 in Nigeria. And now, again, he has won a lot of respect by quietly going back into academia, when he did not, as many of us hoped, get the foreign minister slot. Right. Well, um, we started our conversation with him by asking him about uh, the new world order that many uh, contend is being born right now, kicking and screaming as it emerges. Well, yes, that's what I, I, I started with, uh, quoting the age-old um, Italian political scientist Antonio Gramsci um, saying when the old is dying and the new is not yet born, what you have in the middle is a whole range of morbid uh, 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 situations. And that's really where we are now. As the unipolar moment is uh, disappearing, of course, the leader of that unipolar world is also kicking and fighting, yet inevitably, as this historical trajectory has shown us that that's how the unipolar uh, lead also emerged from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana, and then from Pax Americana to this challenge by the Russian uh, um, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics post-1945. And we've had to deal with that up to Fukuyama's so-called end of history. And it's now turned out that history has not really ended and history cannot really end <laughs> with what's happening in Ukraine and uh, now Gaza, which has never really gone away. Is it too simplistic to, to attribute it to uh, this phase of American isolationism, America withdrawing from the international stage post-Iraq post war? 
I, I think it's too simplistic to trace it to that. There are a whole range of developments around the world. The middle powers are not letting off. They are also rising, and they're rising particularly as economic uh, powers. So you cannot ignore what is happening in China, uh, let alone India and Turkey and uh, the um, Middle Eastern powers as well, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar. They're becoming big players geopolitically. You can see the role that the Qataris and the UAEs and the Saudis are playing in Africa's conflict management, for example, in Sudan uh, and in, in the Sahel. This is something that was never the case uh, in, in the past. So you cannot just trace it to a simplistic isolationist moment in America because ironically, America is not as isolationist as it used to be. If Trump were to be there, you could really say, yes, this is a Republican isolationist movement. Democrats are usually more engaged, but more engaged without the necessary um, political authority that used to come with that in the past. In, in, when you were talking um, at King's the other evening in, in, in central London, you know, you were talking about the new opportunities, you know, that Africa's got a seat on the G20 or the African Union has a seat on the G20 as an equal member to the European Union. There's a big push. There's now another chair at the World Bank and IMF, another for an African director. So that's one more than the continent used to have. There's a big push to get Africa a seat on the, a permanent seat on the Security Council. On one hand, it seems that Africa is getting the recognition it requires to get into these uh, into these big institutions. But as you say, on the other hand, the kind of the you know the the real politique of international affairs is that the Gulf states, with their money, uh, their oil money particularly, are increasingly important. And actually, continent conflicts like Sudan and Ethiopia, um, there's just less international engagement. Well, it, it seems to be a bit of a contradiction, uh, especially when you look at the historical trajectory. In the post-1945 change, for example, most of Africa was under colonial rule. It was an anti-colonial struggle. And African leadership burned it together in order to force the issue on the agenda, the creation of the trusteeship council, the beginning of the decolonization uh, struggle, the anti-apartheid movement, Africa acted in unison. Yet not all of them were together, but majority of the African countries were on the same page at that time. But now that we have this opportunity that I spoke about in my lecture, either in terms of our population advantage, uh, the um, natural resource uh, opportunity, there seems to be lack of coordination the, the African Union that should be in the driver's seat appears not to be pulling its weight to rally African countries. Yes, you have a few African leaders, Cyril Ramaphosa putting together his own uh, initiative on Ukraine uh, or even now on Gaza, but which is not resonating <laughs> uh, across the continent, let alone with the necessary response from the rest of the world. And I think the reason for that is we need to see that charity must begin at home. Africa needs to begin to lead on its own issues. Yes, Africa has demographic advantage. Africa has, this is the continent that is going to have one in four people on the planet by 2050. Already, we have the youth bulge on our side. Africa's median age, as I said in the lecture, is 19, and Europe is 38. <laughs> uh, even China is 28. India is 28. So uh, if you look at the numbers, we should be not just a core rule maker in the rules-based international order, so-called. We should be the driver. But that's not what is happening because we're all getting invited to this bilateral summit, Saudi today, America yesterday, China uh, Belt and Road Initiative tomorrow. Mm without any sit down on our part 
to say, what's our agenda? These guys who are inviting us have an agenda. Why don't they come to our days? Exactly. I mean, it, it does seem, our talk. It, it seems bizarre that Saudi Arabia and the US are mediating in talks between two rival factions in Sudan. And it was only as an afterthought that the African Union and the uh, Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the regional organization for the Horn, were invited uh, so sort of to be bit players in these talks. The fact is the talks haven't even worked, despite the, you know, the geopolitical weight of the US and Saudi. And frankly, that's not what it used to be. Remember, Patrick, in the early 2000s, as I mentioned in my lecture, when you had the quartet of Thabo Mbeki, Obasanjo, Bouteflika, Abdullahi Wad, they were able to create a movement of direction in which outsiders listened to what they were going to say before they even got involved in anything on the continent. That was the era of the new Partnership for Africa's Development. That was the era of the resolution of a number of issues on the continent and the peer review mechanism, checking on ourselves, holding ourselves accountable as heads of state. That was when we helped to develop the African peace and security architecture. Uh, but now, where are we? Well, you know, perhaps predictably, um, I think it's our fault. I see nothing wrong with sorting things out ourselves. I blame us 100% for failing to do so. But then, you know, when you have a collection of countries that cannot run their own affairs properly, it's hardly surprising if they are collectively ineffective. You see, nothing matters except sustainable effectiveness or sustained effectiveness, I should say. Yes, I mean, I think Obasanjo is widely regarded nowadays in Nigeria as the most effective president we've had so far. Um, and he has a strong personality. I'm not surprised that arrangements that involved him were progressive and productive. But, you know, he's not the president anymore. And um, Becky's not there anymore. So you have to ask yourself two questions. One, it's about quality of leadership. If the quality of leadership is poor and the countries that they are supposed to be running are a mess, how are they going to do well as a group? It's a chicken and egg situation. Uh, quality of leadership is not always going to be consistently uh, progressive because it's a product of domestic affairs, mostly. <laughs> so if you have another president who does not necessarily see international affairs as a priority, then it would drop on the agenda of the state. But more often than not, external affairs is itself an extension of the domestic. And there, there is always a mix. And Africa is not alone in carrying that burden that Donald described on quality of leadership, quality of institutions, and sustained commitment to uh, uh, improved relations with countries. In, but, but there are no doubt countries. And, and that's the role a country like America has played. There are no doubt countries that both size influence imposes on you to carry a larger share of the burden. And that's the, the, the price that countries like Nigeria and South Africa would have to pay on the continent. We need drivers of change. That's it. We do. I mean, we prance around calling ourselves the giant of Africa. What I see actually is a pygmy with delusions of grandeur. You know, size isn't everything, as they say in another context. And if you're not going to sort yourself out and play the role that you're supposed to play and get your act together, then you're not a giant. Whenever there's an election in Nigeria and people aren't happy with the way that election was conducted, they expect white people to come in and rescue them from a leadership they claim has been imposed on them. They expect white people to, or foreigners generally, to fight their battles for them. And we need to Well, I don't. I don't agree. First, to go back to your original point, it's not always the case that a government that does well at home is the government that would do well on the external front. And if you use Nigeria as the 
as an example to. There, there were issues in which Nigeria was front and center internationally in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, and the Babangida and Apache administrations were really not that well regarded on the domestic front. Yet they saw it as a manifest destiny and responsibility of Nigeria to take on those issues on behalf of the rest of the African countries. And that's the point I was making. Well, let me play devil's advocate and say that when things aren't going too well on the home front, you should mind your business and focus on sorting out stuff on the home front. But the reality, as we have now seen, is that home is not just Nigeria for Nigeria. Home is Niger. Home is Chad. Home is all of these places where Boko Haram and, 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 and uh, Iswap have taken over and are now making forays back into Nigeria. So Nigerians must always conceptualize home differently. Because what happens in all these other countries have a significant impact on what's going on in Nigeria. Can we get out a little bit, out of Nigeria, and can we look at this, um, this new multipolar world that is emerging? And, and Coyote, what do you think Africa's position is in it, given that uh, G20, uh, a seat at G20 is now uh, on the cards, whether or not the Security Council um, permanent seat ever happens is debatable, but Africa is being listened to in a different way, says Patrick. Uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are really that, well, it, it's good that this is beginning to be acknowledged, that Africa must have a role, but Africa itself must be clear about what we mean by Africa. Because if we're going to be a core rule maker, we also need to agree on the on, on our own position on the rules. And more often than not, as, as we've seen in the Hamas-Israel crisis, Africa does not even have a united voice because you have countries that are saying one thing, you have others that are saying uh, something else. So we should have a minimum irreducible position on climate action, on the, the Gaza conflict, on Ukraine, on a whole range of these places, because Africa voice matters. For me, I think we need to be better organized. We need to have a position that is clear, particularly on the major issues of the day. What, what do you see as the major challenges going forward? And I, I guess climate change has got to be one of them. Yes, and, and thankfully, they finally done. AU now has a climate action plan, but it needs to be sufficiently sensitized amongst the countries. And then the nodal countries, as I described them, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, must then drive that in a manner that it will not be neglected when it gets on the table on adaptation, on loss and damage, on the use of gas, and all of those. Because it's no use, I mean, campaigning to Africa that has contributed only 3% of carbon emission, that it should go on net zero agenda without considering the fact that half of the continent is without electricity. And yet, Germany is returning to coal, and you tell us not to use coal in Africa. And um, Coyote, what about um, uh, this wave of insecurity that we're witnessing on the continent and, and the uh, supposedly jihadist uh, uh, attacks on ordinary communities, in particularly in the Sahel, leading, it would appear, to military takeovers of government. Uh, we need to talk about that. I mean, is there something like uh, coup contagion that has to be considered now for the continent? Oh, clearly. Yeah, clearly there is a coup contagion, but it's also linked to the demographics. First, we have to acknowledge the fact that liberal democracy is not delivering the goods in the manner that ordinary citizens expect it to. Second, there is no doubt that there is weak state capacity. We call it leadership, or we call it corruption, or we, we call it whatever we want to call it. Capacity is limited and lacking in many of our states. The third point is that it's linked to demography. The bulk of the people at the forefront of the jihadist insurgents, insurgency are very young people. They never experienced life under military rule, so they don't know what dictatorship was like. 
for those of us who spent our lives fighting the removal of the military from Nigeria, from many of these other countries, we, we, we wouldn't be as enthusiastic. Even when we see weak capacity, we'll look for a way to improve on capacity, improve on leadership in order to uh, address the lack of delivery uh, of, of the liberal democracy move that we, that we have. So I was saying uh, at my lecture that we need to respond to this on several levels because the coup contagion has never really helped anyone. There is no evidence to suggest that military vanguardism will stop terrorism in the Sahel. As a matter of fact, there's been an upsurge, an increase in terrorism in Niger since the soldiers took over than when Bazoum was in charge. So for me, I, I, I think it boils down to what do we do with this electoralism, this election cycle that don't really produce tangible benefits to the people. And I was saying at my lecture that we need to revisit the notion of majoritarian winner-takes-all democracy and begin to look at a model that allows consensus and that allows all critical stakeholders to have a seat at the table. That way, they will all concentrate on development rather than trying to undo one another. Once one of them gets in and another does not. And I, and I use the example of Nigeria's most recent election. The winner has 37%, 63% are with the opposition. So are you saying that those 63% are non-Nigerians or they don't matter? We should be having a Sahel summit. Leaders in Africa now, particularly Nigeria that is chairman of ECOWAS, should actually be convening a Sahel summit and inviting all those states, beyond sanction, beyond penalty, that look, let's look at how we deal with this issue, beyond just change of government. It is lack of development, poverty, inequality, that are driving people into these extremes. How do we deal with that? How do we organize a Marshall Plan for the Sahel that would begin to help people relieve their lives in a manner that self-dignity and self-worth can come back to them. Well, that was really uh, an interesting chat that we had with Coyote, and I agree with you, uh, Donu. I think he's, he's quite a class act, actually. Uh, what else have you been up to recently? Well, I've been monitoring um, three off-cycle elections that took place on Saturday. Um, and as usual, there were the usual allegations of violence, voter suppression, rigging. And, but the thing that really stands out in my mind is that um, someone who works was working for the ruling political party's candidate in Bielsa State in the Niger Delta, was caught with bullets and stripped naked. And this naked video, it has flooded the internet. And, you know, I almost feel sorry for the guy. Yes, you, you shared it with us. I mean, it was it was quite something to behold, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, some people actually felt that, you know, no amount of um, malfeasance could justify stripping him of his dignity and his clothing. But, you know, opinions are divided. Because what some people are saying is that if you don't humiliate such people on the spot, particularly when they belong to the party in power, they're not going to get any other punishment because if you hand them over to the police, they'll be released. Well, Martin, you've been gadding about on the glamour trail. I hear you've been in Marrakesh recently. Indeed, you know, gadding. While I was while I was suffering in Nigeria, <laughs> you were having fun in Marrakesh. Gadding is the word. I was in Marrakesh for the Africa Investment Forum, moderating a panel, one panel on critical minerals with three fabulous women who were so so clued up about the whole scene of of mining in, in particular uh, these minerals that are that are crucial to the green transition and i had another panel which had five expert guys uh, who were talking about renewable sources of energy and the bankability uh, the critically the bankability of some of these projects but the real action wasn't where i was on the stage the real action was actually in various boardrooms and I, needless to say, wasn't invited uh, to any of these boardrooms. But nor was Patrick. But he's still got the inside track on 
the total of $34.8 billion that was pledged. So, Patrick, who were the happy recipients? Yeah, uh, Martin, a lot was going on in that meeting. Um, so the president of Tanzania, Samia Suluhu Hassan, uh, turned up and um, came away with no less than $5.9 billion investment in her country's new railway project. It's, it's very important because it links the um, the mineral-rich areas of Tanzania to the seaboard so they can dig the stuff out of the ground and get it on the ships uh, extra fast. So uh, that was a hugely important investment. Kenya got $300 million for um, power transmission uh, uh, networks. Um, and another $3 billion came in from the AFDB, the African Development Bank itself, Afrexim Bank and the Islamic Development Bank for um, a bunch of uh, agro in processing plants. Patrick's always on the money, isn't he? Well, whilst I was there in Marrakesh, um, I ran into Rugby Africa's boss, Herbert Mensah, and he explained to me what he was doing at the Africa Investment Forum. Well, I thought that I would bring the whole question of <clears throat> sports being big business and that really the people who control capital wealth opportunity are missing perhaps the greatest opportunity, and that is to invest in sports. Why is it the greatest opportunity when there are so many profound failings and, and inadequacies and, and needs on the continent that are barely being addressed, as we've been hearing at this conference? Why is sports so important? I think that money essentially is friends with money. Money looks to make money. So we, we've got a number of different things we can look at. We can talk about the continent and the things that are not quite right in the continent. <clears throat> we can talk about infrastructure related matters, things that are more the duty of government in terms of making it work. And we can address the issue of people who have got money. You've got $10 to invest in hospital, roads, whatever else may be. You are dealing with government on that at a certain level. You're also looking at opportunity as they do as to do we invest more in agriculture, do we invest in this factory or that. And sport is big business. Sports nutrition is big business, as I, as I said in the meeting today. Um, supplementation is, of which there's so much raw material here in Africa in terms of um, the kind of supplements that people use for sports. Yep, agribusiness generally has been one of the main focuses Absolutely. Of, of this uh, meeting here in Marrakesh. Yes. So I, I understand that so, point. Right, so I brought, I brought that up. But sports itself, if you take, we've just finished the Rugby World Cup, expected monies into world rugby, $2.4 billion. Expected. I think that's As what they got in terms of revenues coming in and TV-related matters and people through turnstiles, et cetera, et cetera. Even for the small games, the Namibia against nobody, 50-something thousand people were in the stadium. The breakdown of how they what they make is not so important as they're getting 2.4 billion. That, that is, sport is big business. FIFA World Cup Qatar, how many billions were then raised from that? And how much was spent? How much was spent? Uh, I, I, an absolute fortune. You know I, what the Qataris are like I, I, when they put on an event. Absolutely. Um, but, so we're talking about sport generally, but why rugby? I mean, how many, how many countries on the continent play rugby? 39. 39? 39, 39 out of 50 me. something. Well, you know, you say, how many play basketball? We don't really know. We only know about football. And the thing is, the world has to understand that there is more to life than a round ball played by 11 people of sorts. Um, but it is the, the beautiful game. It it's is. the universal game. It is. Why do you think Absolutely. that rugby can it, can will you, have the pulling power? Just imagine if football was the only sport in the world. Rugby is actually probably the second or third biggest sport in the world that people don't realize. So I've always found that, because I came from the background of football, I run football on the continent of Africa and through one of its biggest clubs. And the fact of the matter is, the African is such an extraordinary being, capable of anything. Forget rugby, anything for one minute. And look, I was telling somebody earlier today that, look, if you go to East Africa, you've got the Olympics next year. I bet you that the middle distance runners who will win a gold medal will come from Kenya. Somalia, Ethiopia, etc. 
It's been like that since time immemorial. Mm. It will be for the next 50 years. If you come into West Africa, you can bet your bottom dollar that within the top 12 teams in Africa, in the world, at a World Cup now, a football World Cup. In football World Cup, it will be a Cameroon or a Senegal or a Ghana or La Côte d'Ivoire or a Nigeria. So the continent is broken up with people capable of different things, whether it's running, sprinting, boxing, fighting, whatever else may be. <clears throat> Rugby falls within that, that. It is the one sport that you can be a two meter tall South Sudanese, or you can be from the Central African Republic and be four foot tall. And you'll be a fly half, would you? You could be a scrum half. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> so Dan Bigger is a, is a big, big, big fly <laughs> half today. You, you, you could do. So we, we got people from across the continent that attract everything. And I think the melting pot becomes the Springboks, who are the world champions for the second time, who are African, who have people from all shades of the rainbow nation playing within that team that is the Springboks. Which brings me to that historic victory, yes. um, which represents so much, doesn't it? Not only for, for an African team, but for South Africa in particular. I mean, it was not since 95 have, have people felt that sort of overwhelming emotion. It's almost as if this multiracial Springboks team led by a black man for the first time was almost keeping the Rainbow Nation dream alive. Would you, suggest, would you say, would you agree Well, with I was that? gonna say because in 2019, they won it uh, in Japan which is what makes this victory so incredible, because it's a repeat. And Sia was the captain then. He's matured even more since then to be, in my view, the greatest sporting captain of any sport. Why do I say that? He's a leader of gladiators. We shouldn't forget that we're talking about a gladiatorial sport here. Men or women. Look at the women. The Women's World Cup is in 2025. Do not mistake it thinking it's a man's game. The women are extraordinary. And I am so looking forward to that. But he's the leader of this gladiatorial team who has the humility and bears all the hallmarks of the values of the game. Respect, solidarity, that teamwork that encompasses white, black, yellow, blue, green. He encompasses it in his speeches that he makes. He's not saying, we just better than you. He reaches out to the foe who he has conquered. He is the Olympic Charter. He is a symbol of peace and unity. And across our continent of 1.4 billion, some of them don't even understand rugby. But they understand the image of the man that they identify as an African, holding that trophy. Whether you've lost or whether you've won, go out around the field and greet your fans and the supporters. Go to the losers and put a hand around their shoulder. Sportsmanship. That was as for those of us, and I'm older than you, I just checked. <laughs> That's what I was doing on my sure? phone. Oh yes, I am. Uh, yeah, Herbert no, Metzer, I'm not going to argue with you while we're talking now. Not okay? on your podcast, but <laughs> I tell you I am. And that were the values that we were all brought up with. So you, Mr. Metzer, are a Ghanaian, as we've established. Did you grow up playing rugby? I did. But not, in, but not in Ghana? No. Nope. I was shipped out at the age of six. I went straight to boarding school. Uh, so I'm never quite sure why people want to do cuddly, cuddly with kids until they're mid-teens. At the age of six, I went, <laughs> I went to boarding school and I've been in boarding school my whole life. So I started playing rugby at six. Um, I went through, I came back to Ghana for three years and stopped playing rugby because there wasn't rugby there. Went back to sixth form, played uh, for Kent College. Um, then went on to Sussex University. Uh, then I got a job in Zimbabwe. And I went, I was playing in the early 80s. Just after Mugabe came to power, I played there. I played my one international for Mashonaland against Italy. I can see you've gone back down memory lane. Thing is, you love rugby. I hadn't realized that, that you actually like it. I love it. Mm. It's, it becomes part of your blood. But you can imagine going in and seeing wow, people can actually have a scrap on the field without being arrested by the police. I mean, it's just something else. <laughs> well, I think you can probably safely say, because, I mean, I remember back in the day I was in South Africa um, in the 90s when it was considered a white boy's sport, and it's no longer that. And I think that must be deemed progress. I think so. I think when people... Uh, 
cry is the wrong word. Uh, try to revolutionize things is the wrong word. I, I, I like the little baby steps that are stomped down with a little, you know, all one 18, 19 stone of me. So you can hear, <clears throat> they look over your shoulder and you realize that you are making progress. And I think that's a critical thing, because you're right. When I first went to Zim, I was the only black player playing in Zimbabwe. Can you imagine? The okay. post-Rhodesia, yeah. I was the only black person playing provincial and club rugby at that level in those days. Herbert Mensah brings us to the end of this edition of Africa Now. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your suggestions. Africa Now podcast, that's all one word, at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, at Martine Dennis. We recorded this on Tuesday the 14th of November 2023 with the technical skills of Matthew McConway. Craig Farriman is our producer. Original music by Enric Adam. Thanks to our guests and from Donnie, Patrick and me, thank you for your company. Thank you.